The topic for today is uh, the highest level of consciousness. This topic suggests that there are other levels of consciousness also, which are not the highest. And so it is good to understand what we mean by levels of consciousness. Some people feel that when they can understand a thing better, they have reached a higher level of consciousness. Some people feel if they have had an unusual experience, it is a higher level of consciousness. I think these are errors. Having a new experience in the same level of consciousness does not make it a higher level of consciousness. Having a better understanding of an experience in the same level of consciousness also does not make it a higher level of consciousness. Therefore, we should understand what is meant by higher levels of human consciousness and what are these levels of consciousness. A level of consciousness is the level at which we give an identity to ourselves. If the identity remains the same, the level remains the same. If we give an identity to ourselves of being a human being in a certain form, in the human body, with a certain name, then that marks the level of consciousness. And so long as we continue to have that identity, that name, that body, that experience around the body, it continues to be the same level of consciousness, irrespective of how different the experiences in that consciousness might be. Right now, we are in a level of consciousness called the wakeful level of consciousness. We are in the physical wakeful level of consciousness. We are in the physical level because we are having a physical body and living in a physical world. And we are awake and not sleeping and dreaming. Therefore, we call this level the wakeful physical level of consciousness. All experiences in this level would be termed physical experiences of the wakeful consciousness. And however strange or unre uh, unusual they might be, they continue to be at the same level of consciousness. But there are levels below this also and there are levels above this. A dream state would be a level of consciousness below this level. If we went to sleep and saw a dream, it is not the same level of consciousness because we give up this identity. We give up this body and assume a new body and a new identity in the dream. In the dream, you can be King Arthur or Queen Elizabeth or somebody else. And you can have a dream in that identity. You can be a bird flying in the sky. You can give entirely different form and identity and name to yourself in the dream and have the experience from that vantage point. When you wake up, the dream ends and you know that the lower level of consciousness has ended. Now, why should, it call, why should I call it a lower level? Why should I not call it a different level? How is a wakeful state a higher level of consciousness than the dream level? This is a very important question I am asking. Because this is a question that a lot of people ask me. That when you say there are higher levels of consciousness and experiences, how are you sure they are not dream states? And I say that dream states are lower levels of consciousness. And then I have to distinguish between a higher uh, level of consciousness and the wakeful level. And the wakeful level from the dream level. That is why we should understand what happens <clears throat> when we have a lower level of consciousness like the dream state. In the dream state, we create not only a new body and a new identity for ourselves, but we create a new world. That world is not there before we start dreaming into it. The world may be similar or drawn from the pattern of this world, but it is a dream world. The moment the dream starts, the dream world commences. The dream world is not built anew. It brings along with itself the dimensions of infinite time and space. And in the dream world, things have been happening for millions of years. But they started when the dream started. So, the moment the dream starts, we create the depth of time and space of millions of years in the dream. When we wake up, all the future of the dream world of millions of years and infinite time and space disappears. When we wake up, the dream ends. When the dream ends, the dream world ends. 
and the real wakeful world starts. What marks the dream state from the wakeful state is that the dream state is sandwiched between two wakeful states. It is not the other way around. When we wake up, we remember that we had gone to sleep. And therefore, it was only a sandwiched experience between the wakeful state. In fact, it is this sandwiching that makes it a lower level of consciousness. If one were to say, when you wake up, how do you know you are awake? Today people ask proof. If somebody talks of a higher spiritual or astral experience, people want proof. What proof do you have that that is real, the experience is real? So you can turn back to those people who ask for proof of higher astral experiences or spiritual experiences. You can turn around to them and say, when you wake up in the morning, what proof do you have that you have woken up? What proof do you have that you are now again in, in the real world? But everybody claims, after waking up from a dream, that we are back in the real world. What is the proof? Do you pinch yourself when you wake up in the morning? Do you open your eyes to see whether the things are the same, which should be in a real world? Do things look different than they look in a dream world? Things look the same. Whatever you created in the dream, the same things look up in the real wakeful world. And how does the wakeful world become real in relation to the dream? If you ponder over this question a little deeply, you will find that the only real reason for our conviction that we have woken up is the recall that we had gone to sleep. We remember that it was in this state that we went to sleep. We went, lay down in the bed, closed our eyes and went to sleep. And in the morning, we have opened our eyes and we have woken up in the same state. That link with the point in the wakeful life where we went to sleep is restored. And the intervening experience becomes a sandwiched experience of a lower level of consciousness. That is how we become certain that what passed was only a dream. And not the, the entire world can come and argue with you at that time that you are still dreaming and you will not believe it because you have woken up. And the whole world can say, are you sure this is a real world you have woken up into? You will say yes. You know it. This direct knowledge, this knowledge in which you have no doubt and no uncertainty comes because of the link in memory with the time before you went into the lower level of consciousness. This test applies to all levels of consciousness. Any level of consciousness higher than the wakeful level must also obey this test, which means if we rise from this level of consciousness to a higher level of consciousness, it should be awakening. It should be experience of waking from a dream and it should be accompanied by a recall of our previous experience in that level of consciousness. If we do not remember that we had that previous experience, then it is not a higher level of consciousness. It is only a fantasy, a daydreaming in this level of consciousness. If a person closes his eyes, and sees some beautiful sights and says, I have been to a higher level of consciousness, don't believe it. Because if he has been to a higher level of consciousness, he will not come back to tell in a dream. When we wake up, we don't go back to sleep to tell people in the dream we have woken up. We are awake. The dream land and the dream experience is over. Similarly, when we arise and awake from this so-called wakeful level of consciousness to a higher level of consciousness, we don't have to go back into a lower level to tell people that we got into a higher level of consciousness. The higher level of consciousness has its own people who are more real than the people in this consciousness. In fact, they are the people who set the pattern for this wakeful level of consciousness. They are the ones who make these wakeful dreams. Therefore, we have plenty to do at the higher levels of consciousness and we don't have to worry about coming back to this level to tell anybody. That is why there is no uncertainty for an experiencer, one who experiments in the art of wakefulness and rises to a higher level of consciousness, has certain knowledge. That knowledge has no doubts. It has no questions. It is a link restored of our previous being on that level of consciousness. So when we are rising from this level of consciousness, what is the kind of experience we should expect? But before I talk of the experience of the higher level of consciousness, 
May I say, how can we wake up to the higher level of consciousness? From sleep, we have not yet found a way of waking up by ourselves. If we are sleeping and having a dream, and even if we come to know in the dream that we are dreaming, we have no way of waking ourselves up. The only thing we can do is to say in the dream to the dream creatures, I know it's a dream. I know I've come to know it's a dream. And by saying so, we prove that we do not know it is a dream. Because if we really knew it was a dream, who are we telling it is a dream? Our own dream creatures? The fact that in a dream we announce that we have come to know it is a dream. We have found out. Listen everybody. This is all a dream. When we announce like that, it means we have not found out. It is a dream. Although we are speaking the truth, we do not realize the truth. Therefore, one must remember that even in this wakeful state, a lot of people speak the truth, but do not realize the truth. The realization is quite different from speaking the truth. You can utter the truth, know the truth, but not realize it, not be in that state of consciousness. The only way you can experience a dream to be a dream is to awake and to remember it was a dream. There is no other way. In the dream, even if you find out it is a dream and say it's a dream, you are still in the dream, you still take the dream as real, although you are saying it is unreal. This is what is happening to us in this wakeful state. That even when we discover the truth and we accept intellectually, spiritually, through the exposure to a master, we accept that this is a dream, this is not real, there is a higher level of consciousness, even when we speak this truth. It does not mean we have realized the higher level of consciousness. It only means we are speaking the truth without realizing it. The only way to realize that this present level of wakeful consciousness is a dream is to wake up from this. When you will wake up from this, you won't have to say or announce to anybody. You will know because you will remember that before coming into this level of consciousness, you were there already. And you will remember for how long you were there. Then if one is sleeping, what does he do? to wake up. There should be some method, some art of waking up from sleep. If one can't wake up from sleep, what is the whole idea of saying there is a technique and a method of waking to higher levels of consciousness? What is the relevance of higher levels of consciousness if we can't wake up into that level? There must be some method. Let us examine what are the methods which can be followed by a person who is sleeping. A person who is sleeping is unconscious of his body. He is conscious of the dream body. He does not know where the body in the wakeful state is sleeping. He has no access to it. How can he then wake up? Can he have some mechanism by which within the dream he can set off, trigger off something to wake himself up? But he can do it if he sets up that mechanism before he goes to sleep. If while he is awake, he sets an alarm and puts the alarm on and the alarm bell rings, he will wake up. But he cannot put the alarm on when he is sleeping. He cannot put the alarm on once the dream starts. He can only put the alarm on when he is awake. In that case, although he has gone to sleep, he has made arrangements in advance that at the right time the alarm will sound and he will wake up. That is one way. The second way is that if he has forgotten to put the alarm on, then somebody else who is awake can still give him a nudge and wake him up. Now the person who is awake, he can see the person who is sleeping and he can give him a little nudge in the side and wake him up. But then the initiative for waking up will be with the other person who is awake, not with the person who is sleeping. And the person who is sleeping, he can only rely on the nudge of the person who is awake person who is awake either has love for this person or concern for this person. If he has love or concern, he will come and nudge him and wake him up. Therefore, there are only two methods by which a person who is sleeping and dreaming can wake himself up before the appointed hour and that is either by setting up an alarm before going to sleep or by letting one who is already awake wake you up. Now, we are in a state where we are sleeping and we want to go to a higher level of consciousness which will be a state of wakefulness. Maybe we have set an alarm. If the alarm has been set, it will sound and we will wake up. If we haven't set the alarm, then one who is awake may give us a nudge 
and wake us up. The one who is awake, when he is giving us a nudge, he is not giving a nudge to the dream body. He is giving a nudge to the body that is sleeping in the wakeful state. Therefore, when he does that, we experience the nudge in the sleeping dream body. The body that we have evolved for ourselves for the dream sequence. And therefore, we feel it in a different way. We hear his voice. The awakened one says, get up. It's time for you to get up. We hear his voice. We are sleeping. We are half awake, but we don't get up. Because we are doing something in the dream. We may be eating our pizza and trying to finish it. We say, well, let me finish my pizza, then I'll come. And the guy who is awake says, come, I'll hold your pizza for you. We'll carry it with us. And we eat it on the way. And then the person who is sleeping and dreaming wakes up. And when he wakes up, he finds there is no pizza. Because the person who was awake, he said he will carry the pizza. Not because he was going to carry a pizza, but because he participated in the dream of that person who was sleeping in order to wake him up. So the awakened person does not hesitate to participate in the illusion of a dream in order to wake up the person who is sleeping. This is the nature of the uh, awakened person. He knows that what this man is talking in his sleep is dream talking. It's not real. And therefore he is very glad to participate in it. And very glad to hold the pizzas and say, all right, I'll hold it for you and take it with you and buy you another one. When the person wakes up, he does not say, you told me lies that you would hold my pizza, where is it? He also comes to know that this participation of the awakened one in the life of one who was dreaming was only for the purpose of waking him up. But it looks in the dream as if he has participated in the dream life fully, as if the other person who is awake is also dreaming and sleeping. So it becomes easy for the awakened one to wake up a sleeping one by participating in the dream and being like the sleeping one. And this is how uh, the awakened one can sleep us if we haven't set our own alarms to wake up. This uh, brings us to a very crucial question that uh, if we have to wake up to a higher level of consciousness, we must have an awakened one with us. And the awakened one must give us a nudge and participate in our pizza eating or whatever work we are doing in the dream. And if this is to be done, how do we call upon him to do it? There seems to be no way unless he wants to do it who is awake. Therefore, the initiative for this exercise goes to the one who is awake. And he must take the initiative and give the nudge. And that is precisely what happens. And we can squirm and turn and toss in the bed because of our nightmares and the dreams. He may like to wake us up because he sees that we are disturbed. But we can't do any more than that. We have no way of finding where he is. We have no way of finding out who he is. We can only toss and turn. And if we toss and turn, and if he sees that we are tossing and turning and wakes us up and gives us a cup of coffee to soothe our nerves, it's good of him. He's awake. The awakened one is like the one who can see. And as I said perhaps yesterday, that if we are a group of blind people who cannot see, we cannot find out the one who is seeing. It is the one who can see with eyes who can find us. Therefore, it is the awakened one, the one with eyes, who can see the one who is blind or one who is sleeping and wake him up to a higher level of consciousness. So does it happen here that in uh, having higher levels of consciousness, the awakened one, while participating in our dream and appearing in some form relevant to our dream, nudges us in the wakeful state and not in the sleeping state and we wake up to a higher level of consciousness. There is a distinction in the lower level of consciousness and the higher level of consciousness. In the dream state, for instance, we do not see colors. When we are sleeping and dreaming, I don't know how many of you have noticed that most of our dreams are colorless. They are, mon uh, they are monocolor, one color. Only one color is there. A bath-colored, flesh-colored, skin-colored picture comes and we are seeing most of our dreams in that color without realizing it. If you remember your dreams, next time you wake up, see what the color in the dream was. Most of the dreams are on that color. But when you wake up, you see the beautiful colors of the wakeful state. Some dreams are very vivid and they participate more in the wakeful state and they are colored. You can see yellow and blue and these colors and greens and yellows and blues. And those dreams 
seem to come from somewhere else. They are far more distinct and clear and less forgotten. And those dreams are different. And they come from a different level of consciousness. So even dreams have different levels of consciousness. One is the pure subconscious level. The other is the, uh, the level which we call sub level of consciousness. So there are many levels of consciousness even below the wakeful level where we are operating now. Now we wake up to a world which looks much more real, much more colorful, much more consistent. And one of the things that distinguishes this world from the dream world is the nature of time. Here time seems to determine everything. We know our yesterdays and todays and tomorrows, they move at a definite pace. And we have given it a definite pace. In the dream they don't move like that. In the dream you jump from one segment of time to another. And there is no consistency. You can suddenly see one thing and suddenly see a completely different scene. Here you can't do it in the wakeful state. In the wakeful state you have to go to the other scene to be there. In the dream you can just jump. In the dream you can do completely illogical things. Here you have to do logical things. There is therefore a distinct difference in the experiences of the lower dream state and this wakeful state. Similarly, between this wakeful state and the next higher level of consciousness, which I might call the astral level of consciousness or the consciousness at the sense perception level or the consciousness above the body level, above the physical level. If I were to describe that level of consciousness, I would say it is even more unique and more wonderful than this level of consciousness. When we awake into that level of consciousness, the experience is of much greater reality, much greater beauty, much greater illumination and light. I will give you a few characteristics to tell you how that level of consciousness is distinguished from this one, just like this one is distinguished from the dream state. In the next higher level of consciousness, if you awaken to the astral level through the help of an awakened one, you will notice, first of all, that things are there by their own light. In this physical world, things are there by an external light. You can't see anything in this world except there is light from outside falling upon that thing. Just giving you some, a few distinctions. Here, if you want to see a thing, it must have light falling upon it, except perhaps radium or some other uh, glow worms or something which have their own light. Even they generate the light to throw light upon themselves. But there is no such thing that everything should be illuminated by itself. In the astral world, everything is illuminated. And more interesting part in the astral world for us is to see that we as human beings in our real forms are illuminated. That we can be seen in utter darkness. That we glow. That we have a shine of our own and can be seen without any external use of light. It's a very big difference from what we see here. So one is completely struck by the beauty of that kind of uh, world and that kind of living. It's so different from here. Then, over here we use words to communicate with people. Unless we talk, we don't, the other person does not know what you are saying. And unless the other person answers, you don't know the answer to your question. Here we have to use words to communicate with each other. There, the normal communication is with thoughts, with telepathy. Sometimes here also we can accidentally have telepathy. But it's pure accident. That's not the normal way of conversation or communication on the physical world. On the next higher astral world, the normal method of communication is by telepathy. You think the other person knows. The other person thinks back and you know. But with our tendency to speak in the dream world, we start speaking there also. But we find that we may speak out words aloud or in your mind, the other person understands. They are heard. And therefore, the type of conversation is so different from here. And that distinguishes that level of consciousness, that level of experience from this one. But that is not all. Here, the physical body is so gross, so heavy, that you have to carry it around wherever you want to go. If you want to go from this room to another room, you have to walk out of it and carry the body with you. In the astral world, you don't have to carry the body, it just floats away. You can just be here and with the thought process, you can just be there and the body is there. So this is a different kind of locomotion, different kind of movement. 
when you see such big differences by jumping to one level of consciousness, then you, this looks like an utter gross dream and does not look like anything real at all. And that becomes the reality because this is being drawn as a gross pattern from that reality. But that is not all. This astral level of wakefulness or consciousness is only one level up above this. It's not the highest level of consciousness. Though many people have believed that that is the highest level. People who have not known any better have said, what better can there be? Well, you can use telepathy. You can move freely. You are lighted up. You are full of light. All that we have heard about as the highest heaven is reached there. But that is true. The highest heavens are there. All the heavens that have been spoken about are there in the astral region. And people who have gone there have reached the highest heavens. But heavens are not the highest level of consciousness. Heavens are only the astral level of consciousness. Therefore, there is a level of consciousness much higher than that. And that level of consciousness we might call the causal level, the mental level. The level above the senses. The level above the physical. There is no physical aspect there at all. Now, when you go to the mental level of consciousness by rising through a similar process of further wakefulness from the astral level and you realize that you are in that world, you find you are always there. In the physical world, the time moves at a single space, at a single uh, um, mode, in a single direction. In the astral world, the time can be made to hold. It still moves in the same direction, but you like a certain moment beautifully. Hold the moment, you can hold it. Here you can't hold a moment. In this physical world, you can't hold a moment. But in the astral world, you can hold a moment for as long as you like. In the causal world, in the world of pure mind, above the senses, you can travel on time either direction, forward or backward. And time seems to be just a way, a string to hold experience on. You can go over the same experience backward or forward at will. It's a completely different way of living. It's a completely different experience. When you can move on time in either direction, it's a completely different experience. And you don't have to perceive by seeing and touching and tasting and smelling. You perceive by direct mental perception, by knowing. The system of communication there is by knowing, not by communicating, not by conversing. Nobody converses there. You just know. When you know, you know. And when you know, the whole knowledge comes up as if you are already known. Not only that, it's a state of consciousness and a large world where the beings have all their entire past recorded there. If somebody wants to see his past thousand lives, one has only to be in that level of consciousness. It's all there for you to read. You can go over it in a library and see about yourself or anyone else that you wish to. All the past and future of everybody is there. You see, it's recorded in advance. It's recorded what is the past, what is the future. Present to forces when you are reading it. This ability to know the entire pattern of creation, the entire pattern of events, the entire pattern of dreams that will follow in lower levels of consciousness, is available only at this highest realm, which is the called the realm of the creator. It has been called the highest region, the highest level to which the human mind can ever reach. There you reach what is called the universal mind. The mind becomes one. You discover that thoughts which looked like individual thoughts to you were only picked up from a mainstream of general thoughts. There is only one thought stream in a universal mind. And we pick up from that and think in a dream state, in lower dream states, including the wakeful state in which we are now talking to each other, we think that those are our thoughts. They are not our thoughts. They are thoughts picked up from the universal thought stream of the universal mind. But when do you come to know it? Then you are in the causal region. When you are there, you can see from where you picked up those thoughts, how they came and how you discovered them. This has been called as the highest level by almost all mystics and yogis and sadhus and people who have explored and the gurus. Uh, they have explored the, uh, the possibilities of expanding and higher consciousness, highest wakefulness. They have declared this as the highest point to reach. They have declared there is nothing more beyond that. They have found the origin, the cause of all the experiences here. That is why it is called the causal region. 
the causal level of consciousness. It is the cause of everything. All things that have ever happened have happened from here. Nothing has happened that has not happened from here. Well, I could stop at this point and say, well, I have described to you the highest level of consciousness. But it is not the highest level of consciousness. It is the highest level of mental consciousness. It is the highest level of consciousness where time, space and causation still operate. It is the highest level of consciousness where there is still a link between cause and effect. It is not the highest level of awareness and consciousness per se, by itself. Consciousness can transcend time, space and causation and go even beyond this highest level of creation. It can go to a level beyond known or contemplated origins of creation. None of us can even contemplate an origin beyond this because none of us can use any other means to know anything beyond the mind. Once we have found the universal mind, the mind stops there and cannot think any further. The mind cannot comprehend any higher level of consciousness. But if we set the mind aside and look at it from pure spirit, from pure soul, we can find this was not the highest level of consciousness. The time-space causation framework itself was limiting the consciousness and we can therefore still awake further. The process is the same. One who has awakened to a level of consciousness above the mind can wake us up from the mental or causal level of consciousness. And if we wake to the higher level of consciousness above the causal or mental level, the experience is unique. The experience is of complete timelessness. That you have a capsule of total experience. And you discover the entity called love. You discover in its own purity. And you discover yourself. First time you will really say, I was not the mind, I was not the body, I was not this. I was this consciousness. I was the soul. Before that you cannot say what you are. When you say a person can have self-realization, the meaning of self-realization is to reach that state above the mind. To awake above the mind into the region of pure spirit where there is no time, no space, no cause and effect, no karma, no actions, no reactions, no evil, no good. It's all about that. All these things that we talk about, evil and good and karma and action and reaction and doing this or not doing that, right and wrong ends below that level. When you awake to that, we have finished all this. All of this becomes a dream from which we awake. In fact, it is a dream. But we don't come to know that it's a dream unless we awake into the realm of the spirit. Pure spirit in that region, which is the pure spiritual region, above the mental or causal region. In the pure spiritual region, we discover our own soul, our own self. We discover what was that which gave motive force gave motive force to mind, to a senses, to the body to operate here and to the dream bodies. In all lower level of consciousness, what was providing the motive force of consciousness? It was that self which we discover as our truth. And there the entire capsule of experience is tied up in timelessness. And from there we are spinning it out, stretching it out into lower levels and forming dreams. The dreamer, the real dreamer sits there the rest are only dreams within dreams. Now, having discovered the dreamer, we have really woken up. Having woken up, we discover the truth, the beauty. We find that all things were lit up by the light of knowledge emanating from ourselves. There is no knowledge except the light that emanates from the spirit. And we become that spirit and that knowledge. We find we don't gather knowledge, we give knowledge. We don't have to get knowledge. We spread knowledge. We are the knowledge. That is the discovery that comes when the soul rises and discovers itself. And then, of course, there is no doubt left that this is the highest level of consciousness. Having risen above the mind into timelessness, into a state in which I can't describe it and you can't understand it. But still I am speaking these words. I am speaking these words to show the limitation of where the mind will stop at the causal region. And yet we will rise to a wakeful level which is higher than that. It is a region of the soul, of the spirit, of the ultimate reality beyond time, in which the radiance of knowledge and of light and of music and of vibrations 
and of power. The radiation comes from within ourselves and we are the radiation. Not comes from within, we are everything. That soul is the self. There, of course, no doubt is left. That is the highest level of consciousness. I can stop this lecture here also, but I would continue because that is not the highest level of consciousness. Although the mind cannot comprehend it, and even the soul will not accept that there is anything beyond that, I must go on and tell you that is not the highest level of consciousness. There are limitations still operating on the soul. We have already overcome the limitations of time, overcome the limitations of even timelessness. We have overcome the limitations of any frame in which we put these things. Got free, but we have one limitation still upon us. And that is the limitation of individuation. The soul still feels it as an individual. It has an identity of a soul. And this itself is an illusion, also a dream state. Therefore, we are not fully awakened. It is not the highest level of consciousness. We have still to awake from that level into a level where this barrier also disappears. So when that happens and we are able to relieve ourselves from that dream state of the soul through the help of one who is awakened to a higher level again and we awake to the highest level, then truly, I must say, we reach the highest level of consciousness, the highest level of wakefulness, the highest level of awareness in which we find there was only one. There were never more than one. And what looked like many was a dream of the one. That the spiritual level of consciousness, the soul level was a dream of the one who became the many in order to have a dream. That there was only one dreamer who awoke and found there was only one. There was no second. Since there was no second, he created the dream. And once he created the dream, he created dreams within dreams to make the more and the many and create a big drama out here. So dreams become meaningful and waking up becomes even more meaningful because when you awake from a dream, the dream memory of the dream is still there, although the dream is unreal. Is a dream unreal? I want to put this question because sometimes people feel we are in an unreal world and we are going into a real world. How is this unreal? How is a dream unreal? When you have a dream, you dream. If you have pain in the dream, the pain is real. If you have pleasure in the dream, the pleasure is real. If you shake hands with the person in the dream, the shaking of hands is real. Why do we say dream is unreal? We call a dream as unreal because the things in the dream are unreal. They disappear, not the experience of the dream. If you love somebody in a dream, the love is not unreal. The person you love is unreal and you are unreal. But the love is not unreal. The experience is not unreal. The experience is not unreal at any level of consciousness, even in the lowest. The experience continues to be real throughout. That is why the experiencer continues to be conscious and awake at all times, at any level of consciousness. And that reality of the one experiencer continues whether we are sleeping or awake. And that reality is expressed in the form of the experience. The experience shows there is an experiencer. The experiencer is the reality. And therefore, he sustains his reality by the experience. But what we say is unreal is that by having an experience in which things and people and matter is created, we begin to feel in illusion that the matter and things and people are real and not the experience. When we are sleeping and having a dream below this level of consciousness, in the dream, we may see a lot of people. They look real. The seeing of the people is ignored by us. The people look real. When we wake up, the people disappear. They become unreal. But the seeing of the people is still remembered and was real. The seeing of a thing is quite different from the thing. I may see a thing in hallucination. I am still seeing it. Thing may not be there. When we wake up, we discover that the seeing took place, the feeling took place, the pleasures and pains took place, all the experiences took place, but the things were not there which we thought were real. We are giving reality to things arising out of experience. And when we wake up, we find the reality was wrongly placed there. The illusion was we made the things real. The truth is the experience was real. That is why 
when we wake up even to the highest level of the ultimate dreamer the one who discovered he was only one utterly lonely because he was only one if there is only one will he be lonely it's an interesting question to ask if there are two and one goes away then one will be lonely if there is only one how can he be lonely if there is only one will he call, will we call him one he won't even call him one he is all therefore the nature of that one whom we discover is not like one as we understand it here here one is distinguished from the many but if that one is the only one is the only thing is the only being is the only consciousness he cannot be called one what can we call him it's a very difficult question find a word to describe him to find a word to describe consci- consciousness the being that is consciousness when it finally awakes to the highest level of consciousness how do we describe perhaps one description can be given and that would be totality let us say that is total consciousness if we say it is total consciousness it can give some indication of what that one is so that one is not so lonely as we think he is total everything that he has created including the many are part of him are part of his experience he has dreamt and created the many and the many are part of him at all times and therefore although we may get the impression having woken up into loneliness into oneness he'll miss this world below he like to go to sleep again he doesn't he creates at will he creates the many all the time and therefore he becomes a creator we call him the creator because he creates if his creation disappears and he wakes up he cannot be the creator the creator can only exist if there is a creation if there is no creation there can be no creator you cannot say there is a creator but there is no creation at the moment he is waiting well if he is waiting there is no crea- creator then this body has been designed in such a way that it can have an access to any level of consciousness it is designed in such a way that within itself the arrangement for triggering of the alarms to wake to any level exist and the alarms have been placed in such a way in this body that we can have access to them merely by using the one thing that is true or real that is consciousness using that consciousness we can trigger off any alarm through this body so this is a unique thing in the deepest of dreams the dreamer took no chance and perfected the dream structure by leaving the scope for ringing the bell at any level and at the lowest level of this uh, wakeful physical creation where we are sitting now in this physical body there are centers on the body which correlate with all these levels of wakefulness so you can ring the bell from there and wake up to those levels the lower level then the wakeful level is in the throat center if you tickle the throat you can get a good nice dream if you want to induce a dream try uh, tickling your throat while going to sleep and you can induce a good dream when you are awake then as a focal point of consciousness you appear to be behind the eyes right now in the physical wakeful state we feel that if we are just a point a point of consciousness where are we we would be behind the eyes if we close our eyes we still feel we are there if we open our eyes we are still there we are from there spread out throughout the body and throughout the world but we are spread out from a point and that point in the wakeful state is behind the eyes when we go to sleep that descends that point and goes to the throat center if you want to check on that you can do it very easily when you are falling off to sleep when you are still awake you do an experiment that you take your hands up and touch your eyes so you will know uh close your eyes and know where you are and you will know your behind the eyes so you can touch yourself and you can experience uh it's not here it's not here it's right here yeah i am sitting behind this you can have that feeling by touching in the middle of the eyes where you are you can locate yourself and you know you are sitting behind the nose is below you the chin is below you the head is above you you get that feeling when you close your eyes and if you are a conscious point you know where you are as you go to sleep you again try to touch the same place where you are wherever you feel you are touch that and as you start going to sleep you will start touching the nose you will be startled by this 
that how come I was touching the eyes, but then you really feel you are behind the tip of the nose. After that, you forget the body. Therefore, you can't touch the throat. If you could retain some consciousness of the body and went into dream state, you would touch the throat. So, this level, that point, shifts down to the throat level in the dream state and rises above when you wake up in the morning and you operate all the time from behind the eyes. When you raise it to a higher level of consciousness, it goes still behind the eyes and upwards towards the forehead. And when you see the astral region, it goes to the top of the forehead when you go into the causal region and goes to the top here when you go to the highest spiritual regions. So, in this body, there seem to be points where there is a correlation between our level of consciousness. And so, sitting in the body, by placing our attention at these different points, we can trigger off the alarm system. And we can use the nudge of the awakened self, the same self, the awakened self whom we call the master. And we trigger off the alarm and we can awake before the time set for it. This is the kind of experience that is called self-realization. And ultimately it is called God-realization. The step between self-realization and God-realization is only the last wakeful stage. So this is the grand experience that is possible within this body of moving from one level of consciousness to another. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions on the presentation. Everybody seems to go on to a different level of consciousness. <laughs> I hope they are not in the throat center. Not too many are in the throat center. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I was a child and sometimes now when uh, I felt a lifting like like I was up here and the rest of my body would like go flat it was, it, it was as if it didn't exist anymore and the feeling was that of, I could just feel my it was as if I was no longer the body but I was up here and it was almost scary. It was like like being you know being lifted out of a out of a skyscraper or something you know. And all of a sudden you're as I was as huge as the universe and as small as a pinprick all in the same moment. And it used to scare me as a child. I would have this as I was going to sleep, and it would frighten me so much that I would push it away. You know. Now I think it's fun if it happens. <laughs> But I'm wondering what happens, what's happening when that goes on? Well, when you withdraw attention from the wakeful state, this is what happens. When you withdraw attention from the wakeful state, then this uh, head which we think is so small becomes the entire universe. In fact, it contains the entire universe. And yet, the entire universe is contained in one point of consciousness behind the eyes, which is like a pin, head of a pin. So both the experiences are true. If I were to say, you are a point sitting behind the eyes, close your eyes and watch yourself. You close the eyes and you watch yourself like a pin, that you are a pin. Then the inside of the head becomes a huge big hole. We bloat it up. It, the size of what is inside, the space within us, depends on what we are, how big we are, how small we are. And how big or small we are depends on what our consciousness or awareness makes us. So when we withdraw our attention from the body, which seems to fix a size for us and the size of the world, when we withdraw attention, these dimensions disappear. And when these dimensions disappear, you become completely different. You can be a very tall person. And by withdrawing attention from the body, one of the earliest things that happens is that you become unconscious of the body, parts of the body to start with, and the whole body eventually. When you become unconscious of the legs, it looks very funny. You don't even know whether you have stretched the legs in front or your crossed legs or how you are sitting or standing. What are you doing? You have sometimes have a tendency to check suddenly. What's happened? Where are the legs gone? You, you can't know what's happening. And when you become unconscious of the waist, you become uh, like you are, mid you are hanging in midair. You feel you are flying. You are not uh, on the ground anymore. Actually, you are there, but you are unconscious of that part of the body. When you become unconscious up to the neck, you begin to feel you have left the body. It's no longer. You can, in fact, turn around and see your body at that stage. And the body, you can, you have an ability to move away, the ability to see the senses outside the body. And you are still in the physical world, but you have that ability generated. And when you rise to the level of the eyes, 
then of course you have risen to the higher level of consciousness. So all these things happen as attention is withdrawn either through meditation or by accident. Yes. At what point within the body or within the level of consciousness do you see these points within the body like you described? I like guess that when we go to sleep and descend, we can't see the consciousness here. Because we lose consciousness of this body. But at what point do we But the these? yogis, the yogis, they do a meditation called pranayam. Pranayam means the meditation of the breath, breathing. So the breathing technique, they concentrate on the breathing and they keep this breath movement on and they then descend from this point to the throat. They hold their consciousness at wakeful level and they can see this point. Then they descend further to the heart center. And they descend further to the navel center. So up to the navel center, the yogis have been able to see through their normal uh, breathing uh, putting attention on the breathing. You breathe in and exhale and inhale and use that as the point for putting your attention on. You get onto the circuit. So when you open that circuit through your attention, then you see the centers. But then the deeper yogis have uh, dwelt on a different kind of uh, 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 different kind of uh, meditation or practice which they call the practice of the six centers. The six centers are, the sixth one at the rectum below, then there is the reproductive organs, then there is the navel, then there is the heart, then there is the throat, then there is behind the eyes. Those yogis start from the bottom. Their descent is not on these centers, but their descent is along the spine. They take the attention down along the spine. They don't link it with the breathing. Having taken it down, they follow a different system, by which from the bottom center, they rise to different kinds of uh, meditation and repetition of mantras and words, especially prescribed, which have an association of ideas with the experiences of those centers. And they rise from the sixth center to the fifth to the fourth and so on. They get the experience of the same centers. But uh, the, the masters who have suggested that we rise to higher wakeful levels, they say forget about the centers. These are energy centers at physical level. They have unusual experiences, but why bother about them? You are already here. In your wakeful state, you are behind the eyes. You are not below. You go into a lower level, in a lower level of consciousness. Why do you want to go low and then start and come up and say, Oh, I have found. You found where you were. You come back where you were. So, why awake to where you are already awake? Start from behind the eyes and go upwards to the higher level. That is why the entire centers, uh, which can be triggered off into new experiences, below the eyes are called the physical centers. And the centers from the eyes up to the top of the forehead are called the astral centers. And from the forehead up are called the spiritual centers. So these are different groups of centers. There are six centers here. There are similarly six centers here also. And six centers on the top, the 18 in all, 18 points in the body. So the higher uh, mystics have always suggested that leave the lower six aside and travel the top 12. In Krishna uh, consciousness, they mark the forehead and the face. Does that help them any? In what way? Or is that just a demonstration for this world? Yes. Well, there are many ways to remember things. Some people tie a knot on the handkerchief to remember a thing. We are apt to forget. Some people in uh, India, they wear saffron-colored robes, saffron-colored, you know, orange-colored robes. Uh -oh. Have you seen them wearing? Long cloaks, uh, orange colored. Chakras. Yes. You know why they are why they are wearing those? Why do they wear those robes? Oh. I asked one of those guys once, why do you wear this colored robe? He didn't know. He didn't I know. I said, I'm sorry. You're wearing it without knowing. He says, my guru told me to wear it. Yeah. I said, but he didn't he tell That's you? That's level of pride. Didn't you, didn't you ask him why, why you wear it? I had to tell him why he wore it. I said, my guru told me why one wears this. It is to remember that this body will be confined to fire. And so they make simulate the color of fire and wear that. That please remember, this is not the reality. This body will go. Find out the reality before this body goes. That is the idea of wearing that color. Similarly, even put ash. It will go to dust. They put ash on the whole body. This body is nothing but dust. Don't forget it. From dust it has come, to dust it will return. And some uh, put a mark over here to show 
the nature of a flame or a light and they drop like candle blowing and they put a mark and they say, don't forget inside this is the light. Don't go anywhere else. But they forget the inside and go on putting more marks outside. The trouble is that those who gave these little methods of remembering something, we forgot what was to be remembered and stuck on to the ritual outside and made that the reality. But this has been the bane of religion and spirituality all the time. The practitioners, those who were enlightened and knew, they told us the truth and gave us simple methods in our own physical outside world, in our wakeful state of level of consciousness, to remind us to keep on doing certain things. And we only did those things which are reminders and not the things for which they were reminders. All these rituals, if you see, in all religions, the rituals are related to something within, to a higher level of consciousness. But we have left the search for the higher level of consciousness and stuck to the ritual and made that our religion and made that our spiritual goal, which is unfortunate. We even, in fact, why do we make a temple or a church or a mosque? Why do we build them? We call them the house of God. Why do we call them? Because we make them just like the head, which is the house of God. We copy that. We make the same kind of a dome. And people used to tie those uh, hair up and they made the same kind of steeples and same kind of form. And they tried to copy. And since the bells ring within, we can hear them. They put the bells outside there. But they were reminders. We are stuck with the reminder, not with the real bells and the real house of God. The temple of the Lord is this, the body. And we are carrying right this on the top of our head. We've forgotten the reality and we are only now running after the reminder outside. Otherwise, it looks very strange that all the places which we call the house of the Lord, of any religion, any denomination, we go there, we find light put on there, candles are lighted, light is put on, and music is played, hymns are sung, musical instruments are played, everywhere, in every religion. Why? Why is this thing only common in all religions? Other things may be different. Because this is what happens here. There is only one God. He resides within us and he has the music and the light within and so we copy it outside. So that should remind us to go in the real house of the Lord. But we are content with going only in the copy. Yes? Well, I heard something lately. Uh, Why don't you come up forward? Yeah, I fell asleep last night. I worked all day today and talking about sleep, you know. Uh, I heard something by... Uh, Sharon Singh recently, he said, they were, someone asked him about sound and light in the inner regions, and, and he said uh, something that sh kind of surprised me a little bit. He said, uh, they asked him, what happens when you merge in the Lord, you know? What about sound and light? And he said, when one merges in the Lord, who's left to hear the sound and to see the light? And I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Who's left, left, left to hear the sound and to see the light? And I thought, gee, you know, I was struggling to uh, hear the sound, you know, and I'm listening and trying to <coughs> see the light. Could you elaborate on this subtleness of sound and light a little bit, please? Well, it's a very good question. That uh, if you merge with the Lord, who is left there to see the light and sound? The light and sound are there to reach the Lord. If you reach the Lord, where is the light and sound? Why do we need light and sound? Not for their own sake. If you like light and if you like sound, I can create plenty outside. In fact, we are creating these days. If you see the kind of uh, discos that are now operating, they specialize in creating more sound and more light colored lights and all that, flashes and all, they try to copy the same things to please us with light and sound. If light and sound pleases us, we will be pleased here. We don't have to go to the Lord for that. But if to go to the Lord, we have to see the light and hear the sound, then the light and the sound are a means to the Lord, not an end by themselves. Actually then the light and the sound of this physical universe, of this what we, of the five, of, of light and sound that is projected right in front of us can be the light and the sound that takes us to the Lord then? These are only projections. Yeah. These are the light and sound that uh, are projections to draw us back. Yeah. 
If we go, if we have to go in a dark night, we are lost in a forest. We are lost somewhere in a desert. We have no idea where we are. We want to go anywhere. There are only two ways we know today of finding our way. Light and sound. If you are completely lost on a desert today in this world, and there is no way of knowing where you are, and there are no stars, dark sky, absolutely dark, there are only two ways to give you a direction. Either a light comes from somewhere you can follow it or a sound. There is no third way. Therefore, light and sound are the indicators of the direction in which to move. They are also the direction, uh, in direction indicators in the spiritual journey. And they give you the direction. So when you withdraw your attention from here, you create darkness by closing your eyes. You create stillness by closing your ears. You become deaf to the world. You become, become blind to the world. You get into darkness. That's where you want to find where the Lord is. And then you see the light. And you hear the sound. And you know where to go. When you're going there, the, si the, the sight of that light and the hearing of that sound is only a means to go there. You're not going for the light and the sound. You're going for the Lord. When you go to the Lord, you will tell the Lord, Lord, I've come here, but where is my light and sound? I want to go back to that. You won't do that. But apart from that, I want to mention about the other phrase you have used, merging with the Lord. That is a more dangerous proposition. Dangerous? Yes, people are very frightened by that concept, especially in the West. Today, I also got frightened when I came to the West and studied in an American university. After spending a year there and being imbibed with the ideas of my student friends here, I was struck by the soundness of the argument that today I have an identity. I am so and so and I am a seeker of God. God is there everywhere. He is having a nice time propagating himself everywhere, whatever he is doing, hiding somewhere or visible somewhere or invisible, whatever he's doing, he's doing his own thing. I am a seeker of God. I have my identity. I can love him. He can love me. There is a path to traverse and we can reach there. And if at the end of it all, I'm just going to merge in him and be what he is, what's the good of it? What do I get out of it? By merging in the Lord, the Lord is already there. What do I get out of it? I lose whatever I have. I lose my identity. I lose uh, the experience of love. I lose the experience of seeking. I lose all experiences. To gain what? Nothing. Merger. Just to get lost in the big ocean. Today I am a drop. And I go and merge in the ocean. I am finished. The ocean, has always, the ocean hasn't gained a thing by a drop merging into it. Who has gained? I have lost and who has gained? Nobody. This merger theory really frightened me. That if the soul merges in the Lord, like a drop merges in the ocean, it's terrible. But this is not the correct way to understand this merger. There is an er error, a fallacy in this. The fallacy is that in the case of a drop taken out of the ocean, the drop has been actually separated from the ocean. Therefore, it has been given an identity. In the case of the soul, it has not been separated from the Lord. It is only in awareness it has become a soul. So let us imagine that the drop of the ocean is still in the ocean. What is the ocean except so many drops? You go and look at the ocean tomorrow and say there is the ocean and there is so much water and each, each drop you can see there. What is a drop? It is just a little part of the water. Now supposing that is the drop, how will it merge? It will merge not by going anywhere but by becoming the ocean. It is the ocean. When you reduce the awareness to small dimension, it becomes a drop. When you enlarge the awareness to totality, it becomes the ocean. The journey of the soul to the Lord is like that. The soul never left the Lord. It did not go anywhere physically or move away. It only lost the awareness of being total. And having lost the awareness, it regains the awareness of totality and becomes the Lord. It was always the Lord. The Lord reduced its awareness to the soul and to the mind, to the body, to all these levels and regained those levels and became one that was there all the time. Therefore, it is a regain of consciousness, of totality and not a loss. When you understand merger in that sense, then it becomes worthwhile. Then it is a state of wakefulness.
lot of a merger of a drop with the ocean. In that sense, it's a beautiful experience. Then, of course, once you are there, supposing a ray of light merges in the sun, what happens? The sun is shining and the ray of light is coming from here. We see the ray of light and then we say this ray of light will go back and merge in the sun. Will the light disappear? Has the ray of light disappeared? No, it's gone where it came from. It was part of the sun. It wouldn't be there but for the sun. The sun made the ray of light. The soul is like the ray of light. When it merges, it becomes the sun. The light is there much more than earlier. You haven't lost. The sound is there much more than earlier. So you don't lose anything. You go to the totality of light and sound. So there is no one left to see the light and sound. Because you become the light and sound in its totality. Who is going to see that? That is the deeper interpretation of the statement you heard. Yes. I have a question. I don't know how to phrase it, but I'll try. What is the difference, if there is any, between an individual while in the physical body is seeking the highest form of consciousness but is unable to attain it if he dies and goes to the astral and still seeks it? Unable to attain it there, dies, goes to the causal. But before he leaves the causal body, attains the highest level of consciousness, but still has the causal body. What is the difference between an individual like that and one who has the physical body and gets the highest level of consciousness while it's within the physical body? The physical one is much luckier. He is in a much better position than the one who is sitting in the causal body. Now, you'll ask me why. The reason is that one in the causal body knows everything, past, present, future. He knows when he will go. He can't do a thing. He's helpless. He's sitting like a, a cabbage on a table in the causal body. He has full knowledge. At that level of consciousness, he has full knowledge. He can't do a thing to it. He can't see. Because when he knows, what will he see? He knows when he can get it, when he will get it. Everything is laid on. What can he do? Nothing but watch and witness. In the physical body, we don't know anything. In ignorance, we have a free will. In ignorance, we say, we can find, we will make the effort. And we become the seekers. We become the lovers. We have a unique experience we can't have at any other level of consciousness. Therefore, in the physical body, you can have the experience of being a lover, being a seeker, being an, one who makes an effort, trying all the beauty of that, trying and struggling and doing and getting there is only possible in the physical body. Why? Because you are blocked from knowledge. In ignorance, you are doing all this. So there is uh, there's a truth that ignorance is bliss in this particular case. Mm -hmm. but, and here, if you make that effort and do all this, although it is fully recorded, but this effort, this use of the illusion of I is only possible in the physical body. And since you can use I in illusion in the physical body, this physical body becomes the best means of attaining the highest level of consciousness. You can do it much faster here than anywhere else. But once the highest level of consciousness is attained for an individual who's in the physical body and hasn't passed away, and one who's in the causal body but has attained it, still has the causal body if such a thing exists. The difference would be that in the physical body he can still help other physical body. So there's he can, joy in yes. that would be denied that one. Yes. Today you can't see somebody in the causal body, but you can see one in the physical body. The physical body who has got highest consciousness is God in human form, in flesh. If God walks in flesh, in human form, how lucky for the other human being. But if he walks in causal form, what do we get, uh, get out of? <laughs> yes. You know, I've been thinking an awful lot about this. Uh, I read a kind of an interesting book a few years ago. I, I say these questions to you. I saw you in 1979. I thought, I got to see Ishwar. Anyway, you know, I read this book, Radha Swami Agra. They, uh, uh, I mean, Radha Swami Agra. And this guy said that the word, which is what God is, you know, the word understanding is what God's will is or what he decides to <clears throat> do next, you know. And it said for a while in this R.S. Agra book, God used to just project 
like he's doing now, but for a while, he'd just project an audience, and the audience would clap, and oh, we're God, and, and you know, and then they'd go back to him, and then he'd project a little further, and he taught, I got this picture of how the word has emanated since the beginning when uh, we were maybe all in one ocean, you know, and he, he projected, and he said this went on for a while, where he would project an audience that knew he was God, and, and we knew we were God in the audience, and uh, 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 we would clap because we were God, and we were applauding for God, and the whole thing was just con total consciousness, you know. And then, uh, to make things more complicated, like I heard you talking on this tape the other night I was listening to, um, about uh, how God had to really set up all this illusionary... Uh, uh, pl plots and, and settings to make it seem more real, you know, uh, that we weren't God. And uh, then, uh, anyway, what I'm trying to ask now is, Ish Ishwar, about my question, was I've been thinking a lot about the future and what he's going to do next, you know. Like, uh, I, some people come up to the Master and they say, Master, will we ever have to go through this life again, you know, anything like this? As if they're saying, this is the worst thing you could have done to me, you know, was to separate me. But I get this sense that this must have been the best body God could have put us in right now, right at this moment, or right in this series of experiences, that this must have been the best thing we could have gone through. So I'm wondering, my question is, Ishwar, will he develop a better temple or a better uh, place for us? say by the year 2080 or you know uh you know will they come up with a better <laughs> way out, you know i mean he's developed this wonderful temple and mother shop's got the five elements now and uh cal and the whole thing you know is so complex and stuff and I'm wondering, where are we going to be by the year 2080, even a hundred years from now, especially as Satsangis, you know? I can't imagine what's coming next. And even for those people uh, who have meditated a lot this life, and they think they know God, you know, and stuff like this, what divine plan is coming next? Now, uh, have you heard anything about <laughs> And long distance? <laughs> You mean a long distance with God? <laughs> I, I'm wondering, you know, I don't care about the past. <laughs> long distance in there. <laughs> on the hotline. One can talk on the hotline. Well, I can uh, only say that if you're talking of the exteriors of these temples of God, certainly there'll be better models produced. Even automobile manufacturers come out with new models. <laughs> Surely better models will come, but the internal machinery is basically the same. Will we ever get tired of this human type of existence? I mean, this, this, what we want, what I'm saying, what I'm really asking is this. When we, you know, let's say when we die and dust to dust and ashes to ashes and the soul comes to the eye center, goes up and in, you know, when we get all the way back, will we say, I want to do it again? Will we ask him if we can come back oh up and experience the whole thing over again? Or will we okay, want you, to say, you answer this one. You answer this one. If you got a chance, would you ask to come again or no? Well, it depends on... <laughs> probably no. Fine. But That's the answer. It's so dramatic here. It's, it's interesting in its own... But you haven't, seen the, you haven't seen the drama on the other side. That's so you have to make up your mind after seeing both sides. No, but this body thing is so, it's is just so, fa it's fascinating to put a soul in a body. That's his whole idea, I know it, you know. And I think he might, if he stays with that concept, you know, if he... <laughs> 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 you can change <laughs> I just don't understand, you know. I'm just wondering about the, what this future talks about. But I shouldn't worry about it. Even Sharon Singh told me, why should we want to know our future? Is it not sufficient that our future is in his hands? And he just said, forget it for now, you know. Don't worry, it's in his hands. And I just thought, well, you know. Because if the Lord is meditating and meditating on better ideas, better ways, better, you know, 
I would think that he would come up with something just. He doesn't have to do that because he set human beings to do that. Yeah. yeah. But you are saying now the Lord is meditating on better things. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't meditate on doing anything better than what he is doing. Yeah. He set human beings to do that. He's got the human. He's got the human beings to do this. What you are saying. Yeah. To design better things and better things. Yeah. Human beings are doing it. The Lord doesn't have to do it anymore. Yeah. But I mean, a different body or some 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 different. Where we're all the human beings will design that. Yeah. Not the Lord. The human beings have been set on this task. Yeah. We're doing this task in the human body. Is yeah. That what you mean? That's right. I see. Okay. Well, still, well, maybe in the future we'll all be in different bodies, saying we thought the human thing was the best, you know. But I don't know, right? Well, maybe we may like the human body so much and the human drama at this level of wakefulness so much, we may like to come again. Well, so what? Yeah, even if I it's not a one-time dream. We go to sleep every night now and have dreams. If it doesn't bother us, we go to sleep again next night. It's not a horrible thing to sleep. It's only a horrible thing to sleep and not to be able to wake up or not to be aware that you will wake up. Sleeping is not a horrible thing. So long as you know you are going to sleep, it's fine. Every night we sleep. Every night we lose consciousness of the body. Every night we create a illusion, illusory body. Every night we do it. We don't bother. Therefore, sleeping is no problem. Sleeping and dreaming is no problem. So long as we retain our awareness that our identity is the wakeful one and we just go to sleep and wake up. It depends on where we hold our identity. If the identity is held with the Lord, you can go to sleep as often as you like at any level of consciousness. You can be fascinated by one level, go there. All I can say is, from whatever little I have heard about different levels of consciousness, there is far more fascination at the astral and causal levels than here. In fact, people who are in the process of wakefulness from level to level, they get stuck in these levels. They never want to wake up anymore. People who have woken up from this physical level to the astral level are so struck and fascinated by the experience there, they don't want to wake up anymore, nor come here. They say, that is the heaven, the ultimate. Mm. So there is far more fascination at other levels of experience than we know here. So when you see those, compare and make up your mind yeah. where you want to go. The Lord will not stop you from dreaming into any state. I also have another thought as far that I'd like to just verify with you and see if you knew if this was going to happen, you know. I was thinking, I just read in volume 5 that the whole universe longs for the dust of the feet of the saints. And I thought, you know, uh, and then in that same line, Dr. Randolph Stone says on the, one of the first pages of the Mystic Bible, that the whole universe is either subconsciously or consciously longing for the Lord. They subconsciously they don't they're not quite sure what they're saying or what they know what they want. Consciously they know what they want, spiritual food, meditation on the Lord, you know. But a great master phrase is that the whole universe, everything he's created, even to the remotest parts of the creation, is longing for the dust of the feet of the saints. And I thought if that's the case. You know, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing someday if all of us were doing seva for the living master? I don't know, you know, Sharan Singh or his successor or whatever, but uh, I thought what a nice idea, you know, to think about everybody in harmony doing seva for the Lord, even Ronald Reagan and the presidents and Prince Charles and everybody, you know, uh, doing something, some conscious part, you know, I thought that would be a nice uh, way to go or something to have happen, but I don't know if this is true, uh, if that will happen. Do you ever foresee a day? No, I don't. I don't for the simple reason that today, after seeing what is going on, we can say what is harmony. But if everybody is in harmony, how will we know it is harmony? How do we come to know it is all harmony and good and peaceful if there is nothing else to see and compare it with? But when I see the Dara and the... And you see from outside and then you go there, then you see harmony. If there is no outside, everything is in harmony, how will you know it is harmony? I'm, this experience, good and bad, is created by pairs of opposites. Unless you have the opposite, you will never experience the good side. If you have no disharmony, no violence, no problems, no worries, no troubles, you will never see harmony, peace and good. Yeah. Therefore, you need both. Therefore, this world will carry on with both. But you 
Okay, then you've been to Dara. Does Dara ever have any disharmony at Dara? No, but Dara, if the whole world becomes a Dara, will it have harmony or disharmony? I would think it would be sattva or harmony. How will you know? By, by Comparing with what? Harmony, it's only when you go from outside the dera into the dera that you see harmony. Yeah, but I can see films of dera and see harmony at dera and people all carrying dirt. I, you yeah, but I am saying if the whole world becomes a dera yeah. and the whole world lives in that harmony, will they still feel it is harmony? Yes, because we've had so much disharmony. We all know what disharmony is. No, but we will have gone. It's a new generation that will come. That's right. The, the new generation will never know they have got harmony. No, we it's just like this that supposing we we have light all the time and we don't have darkness, we can never see the light. Yes. We today see the light only because we have darkness. Yeah, Therefore, if we have no disharmony, we will never see harmony. But what, but what I'm saying is the soul knows birth and rebirth and, and uh, coming and going and all that already. So this is why I say we know what disharmony is, uh, and even like, how do you know? Because even how do you know disharmony? Because I know what birth and rebirth means. I know, I don't want to die again. You have been through it, right? Yeah. So if I saw the whole world in harmony, I thought that we could experience a sense of harmony. But I'm probably wrong. No, the whole world cannot experience harmony. It will no longer remain harmony unless part of the world remains in disharmony to show that the rest is in harmony. The whole world cannot have a good experience unless part of it has a bad experience to show that the other one has got good experience. All these experiences, including harmony and disharmony, are only relative one to the other. And if the other one disappears, then the harmony also disappears. I see. So therefore, the present structure has to be maintained in order to see harmony. I understand. And it will remain a little island in a sea of troubles. Right, the harmony will be a, a island in the sea of trouble. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to digest on that. Yes. This is where you, uh, you made mention that when we're here, uh, we probably wouldn't want to come back. But when we went to the astral region, then we can make up our mind. I sense that perhaps we had that choice at one time. Uh, and I've, I've heard a tape of yours before when you mentioned about somebody who didn't have a master said, well, yes, you can as long as you go back and, uh, to this world and get in the illusion of having a free choice. And I get the feeling that is this the time at which it would shorten the time that we would be able to go back to yes. the Father? Yes. Is that the reason? That's right. And when we get back in, once we made the conscious right. choice, in the astral region, okay, blissful, beautiful, you may not have to go back if I want to shorten the length of time. Yes. And then then you can come back. We made that decision, then we met the master. That's it. You are right. Thank you very much.